For more on U.S. foreign policy, I'm joined now by Joel Rubin, president of the Washington Strategy Group. He's also a former deputy assistant secretary of state. Um, well, over at the State Department today, uh, news in itself, there was a news briefing. Uh, we hadn't seen any of these uh, since uh, the Trump administration started. What does that tell us about the state of the State, of the state Department? Well, it tells us that uh, perhaps we're going to learn more about the foreign policy of this administration. We still don't really have a sense of the direction of where they want to go in the Middle East. What's the policy towards East Asia? Uh, how are we going to handle Russia and, and uh, Ukraine and, and all the various crises? And uh, the State Department press briefing has been a consistent staple of the media environment for decades in Washington and around the world. To not have that really leaves a vacuum of what America is trying to do on the world stage. The Secretary of State Rex Tillerson uh, picked a deputy, Elliot Abrams. He got spiked by the White House. Uh, they said, no way. Talk to me about uh, just what the situation's like, because we've seen so many people leaving, uh, not a lot of people coming in. Is it in disarray? I mean, you must talk to people over there. What, what are you hearing? Well, add to that as well the rumors about a severe budget cut, uh, upwards of 35, 37 uh, percent of the diplomatic corps, of the programs of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Right now, the career people at the State Department are concerned. They are wondering what the future holds. Decision making really is important in moving the bureaucracy forward and the diplomacy, but we don't have decision makers currently in place. Uh, there are no assistant secretaries that are appointed by the White House, uh, no deputy secretaries you mentioned. And also from a Trump administration perspective, this is not very helpful because they want to enforce their policy into the State Department. But when they don't have people in the building, it's hard for their efforts for their vision to get executed. What does that do for, for the Secretary of State where his deputy, his, the one he wants, gets spiked by the White House? I mean, what kind of message does that send? We know that he's going to China, he'll be going to Japan, the ROK. If, if people are talking to him, are they really talking to somebody of influence or not when this is happening? Well, there is a deep concern about how close the Secretary is to the President. Now, ultimately, at the State Department, they measure essentially their power and influence by the proximity of the secretary to the White House. Currently, that's a big question. If there's no deputy, if the one that the secretary wanted was not supported by the White House, it raises concerns. It can be ameliorated, it can be fixed once they get a deputy named, but every day that goes forward without a deputy secretary is one more day of uncertainty and concern about the influence that the State Department has on foreign policy. Trump administration appears to be ready to go ahead with that. Already some parts heading over to the ROK. Uh, I had a guest on last week who was talking about uh, the level of disenchantment within the Republic of Korea about this. Also, uh, th he said that there's probably, once uh, people here in the United States get wind of it, there'll probably be some disenchantment here. Obviously, China and Russia not happy about it. What's Tillerson going to be faced when he heads into that region and tries to discuss this very important issue? Well, he's going to have to discuss a variety of issues with, with key players in the region who right now don't really understand what the direction is from the White House and from the Trump administration. He's following on what Secretary of Defense Mattis uh, led with when he went out to the region and, and made very strong statements, particularly on Korea and on ensuring that North Korea would not uh, engage in behavior that was risky. But we've seen North Korean behavior be risky, so they're going to be looking in the region for American assurances from a security perspective and a diplomatic perspective. The concern is, will there be enough follow-up capacity at the State Department to really put teeth into those assurances? China has always pushed for the six-party talks, feeling like a diplomatic solution is the right answer to this yes. issue. Um, do you think that that's something that would go over well with Tillerson and the Trump administration? There's been a lot of back and forth behind the scenes about how to engage North Korea. And is it six party talks? Is there a direct channel? Uh, there was close, there was a, a, a very close uh, opportunity a couple of weeks ago for a direct channel, but then visas for North Korean diplomats were canceled. So uh, there is the potential for a creative way forward if this administration wants to do it. One thing that this administration has is the opportunity to think out of the box. Currently, it is, it is clearly against much of the status quo on multiple issues. It can be creative on North Korea policy, but right now it hasn't chosen or shown that it's willing to go that route. How do you think that session is going to go when it gets over into that region? No. I think it's going to be a, a, a listening tour in many ways for Rex Tillerson. He's Which still he's already done mode, quite a bit of. And he's doing that, and he's doing that around the globe. The, the, the key question is, is when he listens, will he then translate what he hears back into the bureaucracy of the State Department so that they can begin to execute a clear vision on what it is that the administration wants to do. That's what we need to see, really, from this trip. All right, Joel, always a pleasure having you on the broadcast. Thanks My so pleasure. much.